Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Tom Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind troubled with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones you can't solve right now, and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go, and drifting into sleep. Let my voice wash over you at a comfortable volume, and allow yourself to be distracted from the stresses and worries that play on your mind. Whether you need help falling asleep, or going back to sleep in the middle of the night, You can trust me to keep you company and help you to wake up tomorrow in a rested state. You may need to try out Sleepy Time Tales for a few nights to get used to this slightly strange idea, but I believe it will be well worth your while. Because I'm here to work with you, to create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So settle down, relax, and allow yourself to get lost in my telling of tonight's story. But before we get to the story, I'd like to take a few minutes of your time. If you're finding Sleepy Time Tales helpful to help you to get a restful night, and you would like to keep it going out to thousands of insomniacs just like you, please consider supporting it on the Patreon at patreon.com slash sleepytimetales. This is monthly support that helps me keep the lights on, and can also get you fun bonuses based on your contribution level. From as little as $2 a month, you get access to early release on the main episodes, so that you get them on a Wednesday instead of a Sunday. And $5 a month gets you a lot of cool bonuses that are definitely well worth checking out. But of course, times are tough for some people, so if monthly is a big ask, then you can also make one sort of contributions through the tip jar on the website. I have spoken about the struggle to keep Sleepy Time Dales going as support has fallen off, but a lot of people have really stepped up to help me justify the time and effort that I put into the show. So it's not going anywhere anytime soon, but I really would like more help so that I can grow it further, do more, spend more time on it, and do more cool things, because I did have quite big plans for Sleepy Time Tales, and I've just never really been able to justify the time to help it get any bigger. So with your help, I can do that reach more people, do more interesting things, and change more lives. And of course, if you can't financially contribute, then you can simply spread the word. Tell people about the show, help me get to new listeners, and help me grow that way. So thanks for your time. Let's get back to the show. We return this week to the Elements of Geology by William Harmon Norton. Landforms due to a river erosion. In their course to the sea, rivers follow valleys of various forms, some shallow and some deep, some narrow and some wide. Since rivers are known to erode their banks and beds, it's a fair presumption that, aided by the weather, they have excavated the valleys in which they flow. Moreover, a bird's eye view or a map of a region shows the significant fact that the valleys of a system unite with one another in a branch work, as twigs meet their stems, and the branches of a tree its trunk. Each valley from that of the smallest rivulet to that of the master stream is proportionate to the size of the stream which occupies it. With a few explainable exceptions, the valleys of tributaries join that of the trunk stream at a level, There is no sudden descent or break in the bed at the point of juncture. These are the natural consequences which must follow if the land has long been worked upon by streams, and no other process has ever been suggested which is competent to produce them. We must conclude that valley systems have been formed by the river systems which drain them, aided by the work of the weather. They are not gaping fissures in the earth's crust, as early observers imagined, but are the furrows which running water has drawn upon the land. 
As valleys are made by the slow wear of streams and the action of the weather, they pass in their development through successive stages, each of which has its own characteristic features. We may therefore classify rivers and valleys according to the stage which they have reached in their life history, from infancy to old age. Infancy, the Red River of the North. A region in northwestern Minnesota and the adjacent portions of North Dakota and Manitoba was so recently covered by the waters of an extinct lake, known as Lake Akasis, that the surface remains much as it was left when the lake was drained away. The flat floor, spread smooth with lake laid silts, is still a plain, to the eye as level as the sea. Across it, the Red River of the North and its branches run in narrow, ditch like channels, steep sided and shallow, not exceeding sixty feet in depth the gradients differing little from the general slopes of the region. The trunk streams have but few tributaries. The river system, like a sapling with a few limbs, is still undeveloped. Along the banks of the trunk, streams' short gullies are slowly lengthening headwards, like growing twigs which are sometimes to become large branches. The flat interstream areas are as yet but little scored by drainage lines and in wet weather, water lingers in ponds, in any initial depressions on the plain. In order to read the topographic maps of the textbook and the laboratory, the students should know that contours are lines drawn on maps to represent relief, all points on any given contour being of equal height above sea level. The contour interval is the uniform vertical distance between two adjacent contours, and varies on different maps. To express regions of faint relief, a contour interval of 10 or 20 feet is commonly selected, while in mountainous regions a contour interval of 250, 500, or even 1,000 feet may be necessary, in order that the contours may not be too crowded for easy reading. Whether a river begins its life on a lake plain, as in the example just cited, or upon a coastal plain lifted from beneath the sea, or on a spread of glacial drift left by the retreat of continental ice sheets, such as covers much of Canada and the northeastern parts of the United States, its infantile stage presents the same characteristic features, a narrow and shallow valley with undeveloped tributaries and undrained interstream areas. Groundwater stands high, and exuding in the undrained initial depressions, forms marshes and lakes. Lakes are perhaps the most obvious of these fleeting features of infancy. They are short-lived, for the destruction is soon accomplished by several means. As a river system advances toward maturity, the deepening and extending valleys of the tributaries lower the groundwater surface, and invade the undrained depressions of the region. Lakes having outlets are drained away as their basin rims are cut down by the outflowing streams. A slow process where the rim is of hard rock, but a rapid one where it is of soft material such as glacial drift. Lakes are faced also by the filling of their basins, Inflowing streams and the wash of rains bring in waste. Waves abrade the shore and strew the debris worn from it over the lake bed. Shallow lakes are often filled with organic matter from decaying vegetation. Does the outgoing stream from a lake carry sediment? How does this fact affect its erosive power on hard rock, on loose material? Lake Geneva is a well-known example of a lake in process of obliteration. The inflowing Rhone has already displaced the waters of the lake for a length of 20 miles, with the waste brought down from the High Alps. For this distance, there extends up the Rhone Valley and alluvial plain, 
which has grown lakeward at a rate of a mile and a half since Roman times, as proved by the distance inland at which a Roman port now stands. How rapidly a lake may be salted up under exceptionally favourable conditions is illustrated by the fact that over the bottom of the artificial lake of 35 square miles, formed behind the great dam across the Colorado River at Austin, Texas, sediments 39 feet deep gathered in seven years. Lake Mendota, one of the many beautiful lakes of southern Wisconsin, is rapidly cutting back the soft glacial drift of its shores by means of the abrasion of its waves. While the shallow basin is thus broadened, it is also being filled with waste, and the time is being brought nearer when it will be so shoaled that vegetation can complete the work of its effacement. Along the margin of a shallow lake, mosses, water lilies, grasses, and other water loving plants grow luxuriantly. As their decaying remains accumulate on the bottom, the ring of marsh broadens inward. The lake narrows gradually to a small pond, set in the midst of a white bog, and finally disappears. All stages of this process of extinction may be seen among the countless lakelets which occupy sags in the recent sheets of glacial drift in the northern states. And more numerous than the lakes which still remain are those already thus filled with carbonaceous matter derived from the carbon dioxide of the atmosphere. Such fossil lakes are marked by swamps or level meadows underlain with muck. The infantile stage is brief. As a river advances towards maturity, the initial depressions, the lake basins of its area, are gradually effaced. By the furrowing action of the rain wash and the headward lengthening of tributaries, a branch work of drainage channels grows until it covers the entire area, and not an acre is left on which the fallen raindrop does not find already cut for it an uninterrupted downward path which leads it on by way of gully, brook, and river to the sea. The initial surface of the land, by whatever agency it was modelled, is now wholly destroyed. The region is all reduced to valley slopes. This at first corresponds with the initial surface of the region on which the stream began to flow. Although its way may lead through basins and down steep descents, the successive profiles to which it reduces its bed are illustrated in figure 51. As the gradient or rate of descent of its bed is lowered, the velocity of the river is decreased until its lessening energy is wholly consumed in carrying its load, and it can no longer erode its bed. The river is now at grade, and its capacity is just equal to its load. If now its load is increased, the stream deposits and thus builds up or aggrades its bed. On the other hand, if its load is diminished, it has energy to spare, and resuming its work of erosion degrades its bed. In either case, the stream continues aggrading or degrading until a new gradient is found, where the velocity is just sufficient to move the load, and here again it reaches its grade. Vigorous rivers, while armed with waste, make short work of cutting their beds to grade, and thus erode narrow, steep-sided gorges, only wide enough at the base to accommodate the stream. The steepness of the valley slopes depends on the relative rates at which the bed is cut down by its stream, and the sides are worn back by the weather. In resistant rock, a swift, well-laden stream may saw out a gorge whose sides are nearly or even quite vertical. But as a rule, young valleys whose streams have not yet reached grade are V-shaped. Their sides flare at the top because here the rocks have longest been opened up to the action of the weather. Some of the deepest canyons may be found where a rising landmass, either mountain range or plateau, has long maintained by its continued uplift 
the rivers of the region above grade. In the northern hemisphere, the north sides of rivers are sometimes of more general slope than the south side. Can you suggest a reason? The Colorado River trenches the high plateau of northern Arizona with a colossal canyon 218 miles long and more than a mile in greatest depth. The rocks in which the canyon are cut is for the most part flat-lying, massive beds of limestones and sandstones, with some shales, beneath which in places harder crystalline rocks are disclosed. Where the canyon is deepest, its walls have been profoundly dissected. Literal ravines have widened into immense amphitheaters, leaving between them long ridges of mountain height, buttressed and rebuttressed with flanking spurs and carved into majestic architectural forms. From the extremity of one of these promontories, it is two miles or more across the gulf to the point of the one opposite, and the heads of the amphitheaters are thirteen miles apart. The lower portion of the canyon is much narrower, and its walls of dark crystalline rock sink steeply to the edge of the river. A swift, powerful stream a few hundred yards wide, turbid with reddish silt, by means of which it continually rasps its rocky bed as it hurries on. The Colorado is still deepening its gorge. In the Grand Canyon, its gradient is seven and one half feet to the mile. But as in all ungraded rivers, the descent is far from uniform. Graded reaches in soft rock alternate with steeper declivities in hard rock, forming rapids, such as, for example, a stretch of 10 miles, where the fall averages 21 feet to the mile. Because of these dangerous rapids, the few exploring parties who have traversed the Colorado Canyon have done so at the hazard of their lives. The canyon has been shaped by several agencies. Its depth is due to the river which has soared its way far toward the base of a lofty rising plateau. Acting alone, this would have produced a slit-like gorge little wider than the breadth of the stream. The impressive width of the canyon and the magnificent architectural masses which fill it are owing to two causes. Running water has gulched the walls, and weathering has everywhere attacked and driven them back. The horizontal, harder beds stand out in long lines of vertical cliffs, often hundreds of feet in height, at whose feet talus slopes conceal the outcrop of the weaker strata. As the upper cliffs have been sapped and driven back by the weather, broad platforms are left at their bases, and the sides of the canyon descend to the river by gigantic steps. Far up and down the canyon, the eye traces these horizontal layers, like the flutings of an elaborate molding, distinguishing each by its contour, as well as by its color and thickness. The Grand Canyon of the Colorado is often and rightly cited as an example of the stupendous erosion which may be accomplished by a river. And yet the Colorado is a young stream, and its work is no more than well begun. It has not yet wholly reached grade, and the great task of the river and its tributaries, the task of leveling the lofty plateau to a low plain and of transporting it grain by grain to the sea, still lies almost entirely in the future. Before the bed of a stream is reduced to grade, it may be broken by abrupt descents, which give rise to waterfalls and rapids. Such breaks in a river's bed may belong to the initial surface over which it began its course. Still more commonly are they developed in the rock mass through which it is cutting its valley. Thus, wherever a stream leaves harder rocks to flow over softer ones, the latter are generally worn below the level of the former, and a sharp change in slope with a waterfall or rapid results. At time of flood, young tributaries with steeper courses than that of the trunk stream may bring down stones and finer waste, 
which the gentler current cannot move along, and throw them as a dam across its way. The rapids thus formed are also ephemeral, for as the gradient of the tributaries is lowered, the main stream becomes able to handle the smaller and finer load which they discharge. A rare class of falls is produced, where the minor tributaries of a young river are not able to keep pace with their master stream and the erosion of their beds because of their smaller volume, and thus join it by plunging over the side of its gorge. But as the river approaches grade and slackens its downcutting, the tributaries sooner or later overtake it, and effacing their falls, unite with it on a level. Waterfalls and rapids of all kind are evanescent features of a river's youth. Like lakes, they are soon destroyed, and if any long time had already elapsed since their formation, they would have been obliterated already. That balanced condition called grade, where a river neither degrades its bed by erosion, nor aggrades it by deposition, is first attained along reaches of soft rocks, ungraded outcrops of hard rocks, remaining as barriers which give rise to rapids or falls. Until these barriers are worn away, they constitute local base levels, below which level the stream, up valley from them, cannot cut. They are eroded to grade one after another, beginning with the least strong, or the one nearest the mouth of the stream. In a similar way, the surface of a lake in a river's course constitutes for all inflowing streams a local base level, which disappears when the basin is fulled or drained. Maturity is the stage of a river's complete development and most effective work. The river system now has well underway its great task of wearing down the land mass which it drains and carrying it particle by particle to the sea. The relief of the land is now at its greatest, for the main channels have been sunk to grade, while the divides remain but little worn below their initial altitudes. Groundwater now stands low. The runoff washes to the streams, with the least delay and loss by evaporation in ponds and marshes. The discharge of the river is therefore at its heart. The entire region is dissected by streamways. The area of valley slopes is now largest and sheds to the streams a heavier load of waste than ever before. At maturity, the river system is doing its greatest amount of work both in erosion and in the carriage of water and the waste to the sea. On reaching grade, a river ceases to scour its bed, and does not again begin to do so until some changes in load or volume enable it to find grade at a lower level. On the other hand, a stream erodes its banks at all stages of its history, and with graded rivers this process, called lateral erosion, or planation, is especially important. The current of a stream follows the outer side of all curves or bends in the channel, and on this side, it excavates its bed the deepest, and continually wears and saps its banks. On the inner side, deposition takes place in the more shallow and slower moving water. The inner bank of bends is thus built out, while the outer bank is worn away. By swinging its curves against the valley sides, a graded river continually cuts a wider and wider floor. The V Valley of Youth is thus changed by planation to a flat floored valley with flaring sides, which gradually became subdued by the weather to gentle slopes. While widening their valleys, streams maintain a constant width of channel so that a wide floored valley does not signify that it ever was occupied by a river of equal width. The gradients of graded rivers differ widely. A large river with a light load reaches grade on a faint slope, while a smaller stream, heavily burdened with waste, requires a steep slope to give it velocity sufficient to move the load. The Platte, 
a great river of Nebraska with its headwaters in the Rocky Mountains, is enfeebled by the semi-arid climate of the Great Plains, and surcharged with the waste brought down both by its branches in the mountains and by those whose tracks lie over the soft rocks of the plains. It is compelled to maintain a grade of eight feet to the mile in western Nebraska. The Ohio reaches grade with a slope of less than four inches to the mile from Cincinnati to its mouth, and the powerful Mississippi washes along its load with a fall of but three inches per mile from Cairo to the Gulf. Other things being equal, which of graded streams will have the steeper gradient, a trunk stream or its tributaries, a stream supplied with gravel or one with salt. Other factors remaining the same, what changes would occur if the plant should increase in volume? What changes would occur if the load should be increased in amount or its coarseness? As rivers pass their prime, as denudation lowers the relief of the region, less waste, and finer, is washed over the gentler slopes of the lowering hills. With smaller loads to carry, the rivers now deepen their valleys and find grade with fainter declivities nearer the level of the sea. This limit of the level of the sea beneath which they cannot erode is known as base level. Footnote, the term base level is also used to designate the close approximation to sea level, to which streams are able to subdue the land. As streams grow old, they approach more and more closely to base level, although they are never able to attain it. Some slight slope is needed that water may flow and waste be transported over the land. Meanwhile, the relief of the land has ever lessened. The master streams and the main tributaries now wander with sluggish currents over the broad valley floors which they have planed away while under the erosion of their innumerable branches and the wear of the weather, the divides everywhere are lowered and subdued to more and more gentle slopes. Mountains and high plateaus are thus reduced to rolling hills and at last to plains, surmounted only by such hills as may still be unreduced to the common level. Because of the harder rocks of which they are composed or because of their distance from the main erosion channels, such regions of faint relief, worn down to near base level by subaerial agencies, are known as peneplains, almost plains. Any residual masses which rise above them are called monadnocks, from the name of a conical peak of New Hampshire, which overlooks the now uplifted peneplain of southern New England. In its old age, a region becomes mantled with thick sheets of fine and withered waste, slowly moving over the faint slopes towards the waterways, and unbroken by ledges of bare rock. In other words, the waste mantle also is now graded, and as waterfalls have been effaced in the riverbeds, so now any ledges in the wide streams of waste are worn away, and covered beneath smooth slopes of fine soil. Groundwater stands high and may exude in areas of swamp. In youth, the landmass was rough hewn and cut deep by stream erosion. In old age, the faint reliefs of the land dissolve away, chiefly under the action of the weather, beneath their cloak of waste. The successive stages through which a landmass passes while it is being leveled to the sea constitute together a cycle of erosion. Each stage of the cycle from infancy to old age leaves, as we have seen, as characteristic records in the forms sculptured on the land, such as the shapes of valleys and contours of hills and plains. The geologist is thus able to determine by the land forms of any region the stage in the erosion cycle to which it now belongs and knowing what are the earlier stages of the cycle, to read something of the geological history of the region.
so long a time is needed to reduce a landmass to base level that the process is seldom, if ever, completed during a single uninterrupted cycle of erosion. Of all the various interruptions which may occur, the most important are gradual movements of the Earth's crust, by which a region is either depressed or elevated relative to sea level. The depression of a region hastens its old age by decreasing the gradient of streams, by destroying the power to excavate the beds and carry the loads to a degree corresponding to the amount of the depression, and by lessening the amount of work they have to do. The slackened river currents deposit their waste in hood plains, which increase in height as the subsidence continues. The lower courses of the rivers are invaded by the sea and become estuaries, while the lower tributaries are cut off from the trunk stream. Elevation, on the other hand, increases the activity of all agencies of weathering, erosion and transportation, restores the region to its youth and inaugurates the new cycle of erosion. Streams are given a steeper gradient, greater velocity and increased energy to carry their loads and wear their beds. They cut through the alluvium of their floodplains, leaving it on either bank as successive terraces, and entrench themselves in the underlying rock. In their older and wider valleys they cut narrow, steep-walled inner gorges, in which they flow swiftly over rocky floors, broken here and there by falls and rapids, where a harder layer of rock has been discovered. Winding streams on plains may thus incise their meanders in solid rock, as the plains are gradually uplifted. Streams which are thus restored to their youth are said to be revived. As streams cut deeper and the valley slopes are steepened, the mantle of waste of the region undergoing elevation is set in more rapid movement. It is now removed, particle by particle, faster than it forms. As the waste mantle thins, weathering attacks the rocks of the region more energetically, until an equilibrium is reached again. The rocks waste rapidly, and their waste is as rapidly removed. When a rise of the land brings one cycle to an end and begins another, the characteristic landforms of each cycle are found together, and the topography of the region is composite until the second cycle is so far advanced that the landforms of the first cycle are entirely destroyed. The contrast between the land surfaces of the latter and the earlier cycles is most striking when the earlier had advanced to age, and the later is still in youth. Thus many peneplains which have been elevated and dissected have been recognized by the remnants of the ancient erosion surfaces, and the length of time which has now elapsed since their uplift has been measured by the stage to which the new cycle has advanced. As an example of an ancient peneplain uplifted and dissected, we may cite the Piedmont Belt, a broad upland lying between the Appalachian Mountains and the Atlantic Coastal Plain. The surface of the Piedmont is generally rolling. The divides, which are often smooth areas of considerable width, rise to a common plain. And from then one sees in every direction, and even skyline, except where in places some lone hill or ridge may lift itself above the general level. The surface is an ancient one, for the mantle of residual waste lies deep upon it. Soils are reddened by long oxidation, and the rocks are rotted to a depth of scores of feet. At present, however, the waste mantle is not forming so rapidly as it is being removed. The streams of the upland are actively engaged in its destruction. They flow swiftly in narrow, rock-walled valleys over rocky beds. The contrast between the young streams and the aged surface which they are now so vigorously dissecting 
can only be explained by the theory that the region once stood lower than at present, and has recently been upraised. If now we imagine the valleys refilled with the waste which the streams have swept away, and the upland lowered, we restore the Piedmont region to the condition in which it stood before its uplift and dissection. A gently rolling plain, surrounded here and there by isolated hills and ridges. The surface of the ancient Piedmont plain, as it may be restored from the remnants of it founded on the divides, is not in accordance with the structures of the country rocks. Where these are exposed to view, they are seen to be far from horizontal. On the walls of river gorges, they dip steeply and in various directions, and the streams flow over their upturned edges. It is not reasonable to believe that when the rocks of the Piedmont were thus folded and otherwise deformed, the surface of the region was a plain. The upturned layers have not always stopped abruptly at the even surface of the Piedmont Plain, which now cuts across them. They are the bases of great folds and tilted blocks, which must once have risen high in air. The complex and disorderly structures of the Piedmont rocks are those seen in great mountain ranges, and there is every reason to believe that these rocks, after their deformation, rose to mountain height. The ancient Piedmont Plain cuts across these upturned rocks as independently of their structure as the even surface of the sword stump of some great tree is independent of the direction of its fibers. Hence the Piedmont Plain as it was before its uplift was not a coastal plain formed of strata spread in horizontal sheets beneath the sea and then uplifted. Nor was it a structural plain due to the resistance to erosion of some hard flat-lying layer of rock. Even surfaces developed on rocks of discordant structure, such as the Piedmont shows, are produced by long denudation, and we may consider the Piedmont as a peneplain, formed by the wearing down of mountain ranges, and recently uplifted. And I'm going to call it there. This should be a nice boring one, so I doubt anyone's awake to hear this. One interesting thing I find as I'm reading through this is they're talking about the uplifting of plains and uh, the bottom of the ocean. But this book was written in 1905 and they only actually discovered plate tectonics in the 1960s. So it's very interesting to see something that's written and seems quite accurate from before modern knowledge even existed. But anyway, that's just me musing to myself. If you'd like to pick up where we've left off, you can, as always... Find the original on Project Gutenberg at the link in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week, but make sure to follow or subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. Good night and sweet dreams. <laughs>